This is disc number 11, August 13, 2015. Well, one word I think will describe what we're going to be about today, and that word is attack. And it's attack now. And the reason is that I have the ammunition. I got the state of Utah behind me, everything from the governor, the highway uh, department, and all of the people important, the attorney general, the other sign companies, they're all ready, I'm their spokesman, and so that in itself is a great achievement. But I guess the biggest achievement in a way uh, was the bank. I switched banks from Idaho to Utah I've been given enough money to keep going, and the bank is collecting enough that they're happy, so everything is good there. Uh, I have Fortune magazine behind me, the article that changed uh, the complexity of Washington, D.C. dramatically. Then out comes uh, the Washington Post article on me on the editorial page that is worth a fortune in itself. That's there. I have Jack Francis, uh, who if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be in Washington, D.C., and so I can never thank him enough. But uh, above all, I really have Carol behind me, and she's my cheerleader. And she was left here with uh, four children, taking care of them, and if I remember correctly, uh, Mary was just basically just a little over being a baby when I first went back to Washington. So that's uh, behind me. And I'm thinking of Carol, I once kind of wrote a little poem. Uh, I got some inspiration from a, another poem or two. And uh, so between the, the two of us, I, I put together a little poem. And the poem, poem says, uh, Carol kissed me when we met while watching the drive-in movie whose heart I was set to get. Say I'm weary. Say I'm sad. Say that health and wealth have missed me. Say I'm old. Yet, but add, Carol kissed me. And fundamentally, with a man, that's paramount to receive the adoration and support from his mate, his wife. With that, most men are able to go forth and do their best. Without that, there is frustration. Well, <clears throat> rule number three, and I think this is the most important rule that I learned in Washington, D.C., and it's so fundamentally basic. It's tell the truth. Because if you don't tell the truth, you do not endure with the appropriate reputation you're going to have to have in order to prevail. Particularly in my case, I was all alone. It was just me going back there. I didn't know anyone. So what am I? So tests come along the way, and I think last week when we discussed that uh, Washington Post writing an article, Coleman McCarthy calls Secretary Volpe, who had never met me, and uh, so I'd like you to read this article. And Volpe said to Coleman McCarthy, editorial writer for the Washington Post, whatever Doug Snar tells you, it's the truth. So you don't have to read the article to me. If you got the information from him, the article 
is true. What a compliment. I couldn't ask for more. And why the compliment? Reputation. Where did he get it from? Probably from Joe Bosco that I'll be talking to you later about. Number one man that Volpe relied upon, an attorney from Boston. Volpe's from Boston, former governor of Massachusetts three times. He brings Bosco with him. And I had met with Bosco several times. And he took me through the test. So, Volpe backs Bosco because he knows who Bosco is and he can read uh, human beings left and right as good as anybody, and he knew that. Well, <clears throat> in the context of reputation and what I think uh, is valid is a little poem written by Edgar A. Guest. Now, Edgar A. Guest was uh, ridiculed greatly by the so-called sophistry of poets, American poets, as being not, uh, oh, intellectual enough. Edgar A. Guest wrote for the common man. Edgar A. Guest was born in Birmingham, England. His family moved when he was 10 to Detroit. By the time he was 13, he was so smart, he left school and went to work for the Detroit Free Press. He remained there his entire life. Next thing you know, he has columns on a weekly basis, and then he has a column on a monthly basis. And it was really, really something amazing. The column on the daily basis was called uh, Breakfast Table Chat. And these were sent out upwards to around 300 different newspapers across America because people liked him. The common man liked him. He wrote for the common man. And consequently, he made a lot of money. Where the others wrote for the intellectuals, they didn't make as much money and uh, didn't have the support of as broad of uh, viewership as Edgar A. Guest. Well, <clears throat> he wrote this. Men are of two kinds, and he was the kind I'd like to be. Some preach their virtues, and a few express their lives by what they do. That sort was he. No flattering phrase or glibly spoken words of praise won friends for him. He wasn't cheap or shallow. His course ran deep, and it was pure. Not many in a life you find whose deeds outrun their words so far that more than what they seem, they are. There's two kinds of lies, lies as well. The kind you live and the ones you tell. Down through his years, from age to youth, he never acted one untruth. Out in the open air he fought and didn't care what others thought nor what they said about his fight if he believed that he was right. The only deeds he ever hid were acts of kindness that he did. Well, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like that, and I knew I had a long ways to go, but I wanted to be that way. So many years ago, 
I memorized Edgar A. Guest's words, and they served me well for all these many, many years. Well, rule number four is pretty much on the tale of three, to tell the truth. But four is rather amazing. I learned this one. Seek out and listen to the right people. Because you become like the right people. And the right people are in the minority, greatly in the minority. My dad used to tell me over and over again, as soon as you're doing what the majority is doing, Doug, you can bank on it. You're doing the wrong thing. And he also taught me, I wouldn't give you 10 cents for a carload of intellectuals. They do not have common sense. They see around things, over things, or under things. They don't see the thing. They miss the mark. Well, that's how I was raised, right or wrong. And, but I think it served me well. Well, one of the things that I did next was I went to Congressman Lawrence Burton, who is from Ogden, introduced myself, told him about Moss's bill. Now, Lawrence Burton is a Republican. Moss is a Democrat. And I asked him if he would introduce into the House of Representatives an identical bill to the word of what Moss had done in the Senate. So now we're working both sides of the aisle or both houses at the same time. And he agreed to do that. Well, I got to attack. So I got that going now. So I talked to Senator Moss. You know, he was so friendly. He was always, the door was open to me. Uh, I could tell that he respected me. He knew that I was a Republican and he's a Democrat. We never discussed politics. I've mentioned this before to you. Well, I said, Senator, you have a bill right now, Senate Bill 1442. I would like to have hearings uh, set up with the uh, Senate Public Works Committee on your bill. Is it possible that you could introduce me to Jennings Randolph? Now, Jennings Randolph is the chairman of the Senate Public Works Committee. Now that name Randolph goes way back to the Revolutionary War. The name Randolph in West Virginia, where he's from, Wheeling actually, West Virginia, is magic. So he said, Doug, I'll be happy to. I said, but I want you to join. Oh, of course I'll be there. So the meeting was set up. Now, in meeting Jennings Randolph, well, by the way, he was a very big man. He was tall, he's big, but extremely affable. A wonderful smile. Uh, you could tell he was carrying a lot of weight on his shoulders, so time was precious. I had, to, I had to streamline what I was going to say and show respect to him. But I had the contract. And I could tell the story, him the story about Utah and what they had done, and how the sign companies had come together, all in support of the Highway Beautification Act. And where did that come from? The Democrat President, Lyndon Baines Johnson, as a gift to his wife, Lady Bird, called the Lady Bird Bill. And I really went into that. And we want to support this bill. We believe it'll work, but we, have to know where we stand. What are you going to pay for a sign when it comes down? We've got to know this. And I went through it in great detail with him. 
And so we would like you to hold hearings on this bill and uh, where everybody can learn about it. So I think Utah deserves to be rewarded for what it has done. Well, he concurred. But he said to me, uh, I'll do it. But you're going to have to sell the sign companies in West Virginia. And they're going to have to tell me that they want hearings to be held on this bill. He said, now I've, I'm going to instruct my secretary. She'll give you the names of the sign companies, give you their phone numbers, and going to give you their address. Good luck. So now the burden was back on me. I'd never been to West Virginia. <laughs> and all I knew was that they were pretty good up, uh, at their university playing football, had a reputation even way back that far. And, uh, but I have found from my experience that I'm not able to do too much on the phone. If it's important, I say you got to meet with them, belly to belly and eyeball to eyeball. So you can read their body English, their reaction. You can shift gears, and you can then have a better chance of coming to some degree of commonality. So I arranged an appointment. One guy, he says, I'll bring all the other sign companies. But what I say is what they do anyway. I am in charge. I got the biggest sign company uh, in West Virginia. It's me. Well, what happened was that on Memorial Day, 1969, I was in an airplane by myself, flying from Washington to Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, actually to Pittsburgh. There, I rented a car and drove it down to Wheeling, West Virginia, and met with him. I, I can see him now. Got a big house, a very large yard, a lot of grass, a lot of trees. He was dressed very, very casually. But what's my pitch going to be? And so I figured I'm going to just tell him what's happened. And that what's happened has changed everything with me and the rest of the sign companies in Utah because they know where they stand. What do they want to know about more than any single thing? Simple. If a sign comes down, what are they going to be paid for the sign? It all boils down to dollars and cents every time. That's all government is, is, is money. That's how the pie is divided. So that was my pitch. And I said, most people think that there never will be a law passed. I'm going to do everything I can to get one passed, but I'm just one person. I'm just from the little state of Utah, for crying out loud. And there are just 13 of us in this little coalition that we have. I know that my chances are like one out of a thousand, but I'm going to give it my best. But I've made some progress. So I she got to see the articles, and I said, isn't it wonderful that your senator would be willing to even consider hearings? And isn't it wonderful that he respected you so much that he asked me to see you to get your feedback because he wanted you to be happy. And he says, you know, you've really made me think. At first, I wasn't going to even give you the time of day hardly. But I'm sold. I'll let the senator know that we would like to have hearings held. We don't intend to testify at the hearings, but we are in favor of hearings being held. I said, let's send a telegram now. 
now. Today, I've come all this way. When you add up 2,500 miles from Salt Lake to Washington, D.C., plus the airplane flight to Pittsburgh, plus rent a car to come to you, all I'm asking is, if you agree, let's send the telegram now. <laughs> me on this one. And he said, okay. So we sent the telegram. Now, in addition to that, Randolph called John C. Kluzinski, who is the representative in the House of Representatives from Chicago, area that was more low-income area in Chicago, that asking them if the House would hold hearings also on the uh, bill, Senate Bill 1442. Well, he uh, had mentioned that there was a similar bill passed, uh, I mean, uh, uh, entered into the hopper by uh, uh, Lawrence Burton. And Kluzinski said he would. So it dawned on me, now we got hearings gonna be held in the House, and hear, hear, hearings held in the Senate. Now, I was fully aware that these two on this issue of roads, anything incidental to it, the House generally would prevail. What happens when you have a bill passed and the House passes a similar bill and the Senate passes a similar bill, they're never really the same word by word, very, very rarely. So they have to meet at the end of the year in conference, they call it conference. Now the conferees is not open to the public. The House would have so many conferees and the Senate would have so many conferees. The difference is this, because the House has so many more uh, congressmen, they can spend more time on their uh, 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 committee assignments because they're not on as many committees. They gotta spread it around. So therefore they can spend more time, therefore they can get into things more deeply. And so when the conferees use, meet usually on a lot of these issues, the House in many cases, if not most cases, wins because the conferees in the House are more prepared and educated and can do a better job. And the Senate, because they have the biggest egos, they all want to say things. The Senate conferees, well, that's stupid. The House said we're going to have one spokesman so that we don't get mixed up. We can't be divided. And if they uh, disagree with what's going on, all they got to do is just uh, recess and then in private meet, sort it out, and the spokesman comes back and does the talking. And so they always have the advantage as a general, general case. I'm speaking now from experience. So I was concerned about this. Well, so what I did was I had to have more ammunition. I'm only as good as my ammunition. So I came back to Utah. I asked, uh, uh, went down to BYU, arranged to meet with uh, Ernest Wilkinson, he had already, I'd already done a big favor for him. I've already gone through that with you on an earlier disc. Told him what was going on. And I said to him that, uh, is it possible that BYU could do an independent study on what the SNAR plan is and analyze the numbers and have premises that you know darn well are relatively accurate and come off with the figure. Like with the figure being how much money would the SNAR plan, which Fortune magazine named SNAR plan, would save the nation uh, by having it implemented. And uh, now what Wilkinson did here was rather remarkable to me. Now, earlier on, Wilkinson 
had decided to run for the Senate, and he ran against Ted Moss. He was way ahead in the polls, but when the election took place, Wilkinson lost. Now what won for Moss was this wonderful, affable, gentle, sweet, mellifluous personality that he had. Wilkinson is intense and uh, to the point and uh, more uh, legalistic. Both are attorneys, by the way. And so Moss won on his personality and Wilkinson lost on his personality. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. So now I'm asking a favor. I'm in his office. And he says, when Moss runs this next election, how are you going to vote, Doug? I did not hesitate. I said, President, I'm going to vote for Ted Moss. Wilkinson jumped out of his seat. He doubled up his fists, and he slammed his fist on the desk. And it appeared to me it was so hard as if the papers were kind of jumped. He says, we will do the study. You are honest. You can be trusted. He said, I believe in the validity of quid pro quo. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. I got to admit, I went, because <laughs> I didn't know exactly what was going to happen when he leaped out of his seat and smashed his, his fist on, on that desk.